Hive Lede raised an interesting point. Um, violence and justice, I guess, violence and social justice, or whatever you want to call it, pacifism versus violence. Now, I'm something of a pacifist, but I, I'm the first one to admit that it's kind of visceral. Um, I'm not really opposed to war on any sort of rational grounds, I, I should think. It's just that I think that going to war and blowing up entire cities and civilizations and stuff like that is pretty crazy, and I don't see how anybody benefits from it. I agree with Hobbes there. Um, but as far as whether or not we are a killer species, or are we fundamentally violent, or do we like violence, or competition, or whatever, I think that, that it's obvious that we do. We like all of these things. Now what? Um, well, I mentioned a while back to Mystic of the Sands that um, I think that we have to find some way of recreating real violent encounters in our society for those who really want them. I guess there's UFC and things like that. I like the um, Russian team bare-knuckle boxing. I think it's called Kulachny Boy, where two phalanxes of guys approach each other bare-knuckled and they just duke it out and see which line breaks the first. Now, <laughs> it's a sport. It's not... I guess in probably in some cases, or in a lot of cases, there are ferocious rivalries. You really hate the guys on the other team and you want to beat the shit out of them or whatever. But from my understanding in that sport, it's always you don't hit a guy when he's down. We're doing this for a specific reason. You know, there's a specific goal here. We want to win the game. It's like playing football or something. <clears throat> But that strikes me as a very interesting way to recreate a battle, or at least the feeling of a battle. You know, I would, I thought about it, and I thought, would I like to do that? I might. I want to put a mouth guard in. I don't want to get my teeth knocked out. But beyond that, I wouldn't be terribly worried about what could happen to me if I went into that. Um, I'd probably feel like a real fool afterwards, but I'd probably say that was fun, you know. Um, but again, I don't like war. I hate violence that is visited upon people that haven't agreed to do it. Um, armies want to march out and fight in phalanx and kill each other. That's totally okay with me, as long as there's no nobody else gets sucked into it all. It's always been the horror of war, isn't it? Non-combatants getting caught up in the whole mess, you know, as opposed to the people that have agreed to slaughter each other or whatever. <clears throat> now, the main point, though, that I wanted to look at is um, Heidel Day's mother apparently said uh, sort of a, in a way that kind of affected him uh, the working class whatever it has, it has fought for whatever the working class has, it has had to fight for now that's interesting, now Heidel Day is English and the English, the British working class in general This, in this I would include the anyone in the British Isles really even the Irish um, has been fairly well organized and restrained um, some sort of blips on the map like the general strike of 1926 or the loony left of the early 1980s um, the British working class has been pretty restrained and pretty moderate but very well organized a lot of people reading, oh, you read a lot of the literature in the of the 1930s, and it's always, it's just seen as British society is nothing more than the interplay of big labor and big business. Because people in the trade unions had real protections. Um, that's why communism never really caught on in, in Great Britain. Why should I vote for the commies when the, or even support them in any way? When the Labour Party safeguards my interests quite effectively without having to have any stupid ideas of killing the boss or revolution or anything like that. Um, <coughs> Britain's never had a social revolution. <laughs> there's, a, there's a statement that people can argue with if they want. Um, nothing compared to the French or Russian revolutions or even the German revolution of 1918 to 1920. Um, all kinds of revolutions and civil wars throughout European history 
and modern Britain, at least, has never had such a thing. Why? Now, that's interesting. You've got the most organized working class in Europe is in the United Kingdom, and you would think that that would mean the most likely um, revolutionary country, but it isn't. In fact, Britain is the least likely country in Europe to have a revolution, unless, of course, you consider, say, maybe Scandinavia or something, but Scandinavia and Britain are similar in many ways in that way. It's always been reform, not revolution. So is it true that you get what you fight for? What do you mean by fight? I would say that the British working class got what it negotiated. Um, it's also, I think, why fascism never really had a chance in the UK. It's kind of like in France. It had to be imposed from the outside if and when it ever was imposed. And I suspect that if, if the UK had been occupied or something, they probably would have put Oswald Mosley in charge of the UK or the Nazis, whatever, something like this. But that's the only way that that would have ever gained traction. Fa fascism in the UK is if it was imposed by outside. You know, German bayonets or something like this. <coughs> but the British working class was better off than most other working classes in most of, Europe, most of Europe. What they got, they fought for, yes, they struggled for, but generally it was more of a power play, a negotiation, uh, sort of drawing a line in the sand and saying, do you want to fight us, establishment? Because we are ready if necessary. And we know you have the cops, but we have the coal miners. So <laughs> um, you really want this. And by and large, the British upper classes balked from choosing force. Also knowing full well that probably if we negotiate with the workers, they'll eventually go back to work. We can keep our mansions. We can keep our Rolls Royces and things like this. But we might have to make sure that they have medical care, dental care, whatever. Um, food, shelter, and clothing. But, you know, it's more of a, a compromise. Um, now, what is that? That's not, strictly speaking, a struggle. It's not, strictly speaking, um, a revolution or a fight or violence or whatever. Don't get me wrong. There's plenty of violence in the history of the British trade unions, and there's plenty of violence in the history of how the establishment or the owners, or whoever you want to call them, have dealt with them. Um, but by and large, such fights as took place were taken place by orderly crowds and in accepted uh, milieu. In other words, the House of Commons, the courts, um, the ballot box, this kind of thing. It was more of uneasy and tense negotiation over a very long period of time that sort of prevented British politics from polarizing. And isn't that really what we're worried about? To me, the, it's polarization that I dislike about war. The idea that it's not just that we disagree, is that you are a bad person. I'm going to get you for this. You know, kind of like the way the United States is going now. Um, although I, eh, the United States isn't going to have a civil war, but I think you know what I mean. Compared to what it was, say, ten years ago, it's got a nasty vibe to it that it doesn't ha that it didn't have before. Um, <clears throat> so really, is, is violence really all that necessary to fight oppression? I'm not sure. I would say it was. It's pressure. Um, we like to think of ourselves as utilitarians. I don't think that we really are, though. I think that we like. You know, it's like the, the Christian era. Nobody believed in it, but everybody believed it th that they believed in it. It's the same thing now with utilitarianism, the greatest good for the greatest number. And we say that we believe that, but we don't. Um, it's always been hard negotiations, and if you don't have the means to negotiate, you're out in the cold. I've always belonged to a trade union in my career, and I won't say I've gotten rich off it, but I've gotten enough. Um, security is the main thing that I've gotten. I'm by no means a wealthy man at all. 
Um, but I, want, I don't want for anything, and I probably never will. I'll probably be active in the union up until the moment that I die or that I'm too... got a dementia too bad that uh, you know I won't be able to function even as a retired employee. But I've never really had or felt even the slightest need to pick up a stick and hit somebody in the name of protecting my rights as a worker or throwing a brick through a window. We all joke about stuff like that, but they joke about it. I'm sure the cops that have watched, watched the demonstrations I've been in have said, wouldn't you just love to wade in there with the nightsticks and the pepper spray? Yeah, well, you know, we, we, we chatter about the same thing. Wouldn't you like to bounce a brick off that cop's head? Yeah, we never do it, of course. <clears throat> so really, what is going on here? When we get out there and we wave our signs and chant and challenge the company to a fight or the government to a fight. What are we really doing? Are we really threatening anybody with violence? No, we're not. Um, it's more of a ritual than anything else to sort of remind everybody just how passionate everybody is about everything. If you have 100,000 people in the streets of a Canadian city, at least, that's a large number. I think in, to get noticed in London, you probably need more than a million, but, you know... <clears throat> You will get, you know, you will get people's attention, and you will make people uneasy. You've already, in many ways, won your battle by making people uneasy. You're just saying, look, things are not really tenable, and they're not really fair, and we want to, or not, we maybe not even fair. Maybe it's we don't like the way things are right now, and we might do something about it. So it's best to talk to us now when we're in a talking mood, and see if we can work it out. Um, and each side sees the other that way. Rather than we're going to take you out and eliminate you as a class, which is the communist way, or the Marxist way, or whatever you want to call it, um, versus we are going to subjugate you and put you in your place, which is the fascist way, you, you'll just we're stronger than you, and you're just going to do as we say. Um, <clears throat> rather than get into that kind of a dynamic, it's more of a series of tense negotiations over a very long period of time with, I guess, perhaps the unspoken threat of, uh, to both sides of chaos. Do we really want to go down this road? Do we really want to become like Syria or Spain in the last century or whatever and just duke it out, perhaps bringing down civilization around us? I think that we say that we're utilitarians, but I believe it's the social contract that motivates us. It's just, you know, it's something like Nietzsche said, God is dead. It basically, wasn't really saying that God is useless or whatever. It's just that, let's, let's face it, people, we don't believe this anymore. Um, be honest with yourself. In fact, we may never have believed it in the first place. Did we ever really believe in utilitarianism? <laughs> There's a question, isn't it?